Hey you, TU crew! It's good to see you. Well, that was ridiculous. Welcome back to another week here at Therapist Uncut. You can't use the same word to rhyme. T, U, but is U is the letter and then U was the word. Welcome back to you, crew. We're going to work on creating some fantastic jingle for y'all because clearly... Uh, not my cup of tea. We, <laughs> or if you would like to submit your submissions. Oh, yeah. We'll so be taking oh, jingle I requests. can't use the same word, but we can submit our <laughs> submissions. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Today, what are we talking about? I don't know. I forgot now. We are talking about how to make and keep real good friends. Oh, yes, we are. Yeah. And I put good friends in there because you, as we talked about a few episodes ago, there are such things as toxic relationships. So we're not necessarily talking about how to just keep friendships because sometimes we need to put some boundaries in place. But when you got the good ones, how do you make them? How do you keep them? Welcome to the Therapist Uncut Podcast, where off the clock therapists who happen to be friends share their uncensored thoughts about real life. Join us weekly in spreading positivity and making mental health relatable through casual conversation, inspirational stories, and real talk with friends who happen to be therapists. Please welcome your co-hosts, Nikki Young and Alyssa Nahara. All right, we are so glad that you are joining us. Uh, so when you hear us introduce this idea of make and keep good friends, what were your thoughts? All right, were you like, oh yeah, I got some of those? Was it more of a, <laughs> what are those? Where are they? I've been looking for them, can't find them. Um, all of those are very real experiences, right? So we're here to talk about it all. And I think it depends on what age you are, too, and what stage of life you're in. If you are 19 listening to this, I think you might be in a different developmental stage than if you're 62. Where do we want to be when we, I mean, not where do we want to be. Obviously, we want to have good friendships. But think about where you are in life right now and think about your past experiences of making new friendships and how they've gone for you and maybe how open or not open you are to creating and making new friends now. Yeah. I mean, just the nature of life, it gets harder as we get older, right? Because we don't necessarily, well, for a lot of us, we're not in the same social situations that we historically were growing up. Um you know, I mean, look at myself, right? I run a, a business and a private practice with my wife. So there's not a ton of interactions and meeting new individuals I throughout the day. I run a business and private what? practice with my husband. Oh, my God. And we didn't become friends till we were in our 30s? Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. No. Oh, 20s maybe? Late yeah. 20s? Yeah, 20s. All right, post-college. It's amazing the kind of relationships. We know how old we are. <laughs> <laughs> the kinds of relationships that kind of come out out of nowhere. And I think it's those ones that bring us the most meaning and value. The ones that kind of surprise you, more pleasantly surprise you. Pleasant surprises, pleasant surprises are good. Can I be honest? When I entered the organization that I did, where Nikki and I met, mm. I went in with the intent. By the way, I was totally burnt out from my previous job. And I was like, I'm just coming here for one reason, and it's to become a licensed therapist. And then when I'm done, I'll figure out my life after that. But right now, that's all I can manage. Get my hours in, and I'm out. <laughs> that is exactly what that sounded like until I ended up in this group with these amazing people that you hear us reference all the time because that's how we met. Yeah. And that was what we're going on seven, eight years ago? At right? least. Yeah. And At so these least. are people that have still made an impact. Absolutely. Well, obviously, you and I sit here together <laughs> all the time. I know, right? So I'm going to challenge you to think about the relationships that have evolved for you that maybe have surprised you. And maybe you were not walking into this interaction like, I'm going to be friends with this person forever, right? And said, maybe you were a little avoidant because for some reason, as we get older, it appears to be harder to make friends. And I think there are exceptions to this. I think there's some unicorns out there who want to make friends with everybody. And that's fantastic for a lot of us. I think as the older you get, sometimes there's a little bit of irrational fear that grows around social interactions. I think personality plays a, plays a, a large role in this too, right? I mean, <clears throat> my wife is shrinking into the couch there as she's watching this because she's one of those, right? We're adults. And we have very different personalities, right? I meet somebody new, and I'm not necessarily out to, like, make a bunch of new friends. I've got really good people around me, but I'm out to connect with people, right? So if I encounter somebody, I'm quite comfortable usually having a conversation, getting to know them, whereas my wife might be more uncomfortable in new experiences with somebody and not feel um, or feel very shy or, like, I don't kind of know where the, the more the social anxiety that comes into it. 
So personality plays a large role as we go forward, too. I'm sorry, personality and pandemic, because through pandemic, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I love people. Let's go out. Let's talk with people. I want to meet new people. And now I'm like, oh, please don't talk to me. Don't call me. Don't text me. Right. But that's just me avoiding. Yeah. I have now recognized that's totally me avoiding when we talk about making new friendships. I am going to speak specifically only because I know she's going to be totally okay with this. Um, specifically about one individual whom I met and we kind of started building a friendship pre-pandemic. And then everything happened and it was kind of like you lost touch with a lot of people unless you were very intentional about keeping that connection. And now two years later, this individual texted me and was like, Actually, it might have taken a few attempts, but this individual was like, hey, I want to see you. What's up? Right. And this isn't like my lifelong friend from childhood. This is somebody I just met a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And a few years ago, pandemic time frame, right? Which, which means is, you met him, things <laughs> might have been progressing. And then, for sure, years. which is the equivalent <laughs> to seven years ago. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but ultimately, she really made an effort to reach out to me. And I still felt avoidant, but I was like, just roll with it. Okay. And where it took us was a park where we walked for like three, four miles and talked about everything. Awesome. And I felt super connected. And it like filled my soul. And I know it filled her soul, too. I'm and glad to hear it because it sounded a little ominous for a second. It took us to a park and I was expecting like <laughs> darkness and woods and like a grave. And this is a park with a trail where you okay. loop around. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it was We're a positive over. park experience. But <laughs> as an adult... I think there's only, I don't know, maybe I'm making assumptions. I think there are some people who are like, yes, let's do it because it feeds my soul to be around people. Then there are some people who were I would more relate to now as in my 30s of, I don't need new friends. And I think part of it's a time thing, right? Who's got time for that? I've got my friends and they're my friends and I don't really have time for new people. That's more text messages to respond to and phone calls and, and birthdays to manage and all this. So I think that plays a part too. The more responsibilities we have in adulthood, um, the, the less time that we have and we have to become much choosier in where we spend that time. So, mm-hmm. so as a part of that, how, how do you maintain those good friends that you've had a long time? I'm going to talk about maintaining, but also rebuilding and reconnecting. Mm -hmm. I think we've all, especially if you're in your, it doesn't matter what age you are, actually. We've all experienced friendships that have served us well for certain chapters in our life. And Mm -hmm. maybe we've outgrown them or we've grown apart or we've been set on different paths. But sometimes there are friends who we just lose touch with sometimes and they are worth reconnecting Mm -hmm. because they're meaningful. And they provide value, not just to you, but to each other. And I think those are the ones that are worth focusing on. Reconnecting or staying connected with the meaningful relationships, whether you've known each other your entire lives Mm -hmm. or you've only known each other for six months, but you really connected at those small interactions over the last six months. And I think the connection piece is cute. Cute. What's the word I'm looking for? Key. Key. (laughs) I'm so proud of that one. (laughs) I think the connection piece is key too, right? Because I think friendships, there's different types of friendships, right? There's the friendships that are formed on common interests. There's the friendships that are formed on similar values. Mm -hmm. There's the friendships that are formed out of convenience, right? And I'm thinking of different examples for each one, but uh, common interests. So maybe you play in a bowling league or softball or, or whatnot, right? Or you go to the shooting range at the same time each week and you meet people with similar interests in that regards, you might be very different from one another, but that friendship becomes a very enjoyable relationship that you have kind of central around that activity. There's nothing wrong with that, but maybe they're not somebody that you would have dinner with on a, a Tuesday night, but you look forward to seeing that person in that situation. There's nothing wrong with that, mm-hmm. right? And I, I don't think every friendship has to be this core relationship. Um, if that's something you're desiring, then that's very important as well. Um, a lot of friendships are... You can, I think about my people, and, and again, this is my own personal experience, so maybe I'm kind of seeing it from that lens, but I've got a lot of my good friends have um, been my good friends for many, many years, if not since childhood, and we have very, very, very different interests, right? We're very different people, and yet our core values line up and match, so we just, we get each other, right? And we have such an amazing relationship. Um, there's also the friendships that are formed out of convenience, right? And I'm, as a parent, I'm thinking about these, right? When you show up and you sit on the bleachers next to the same parents every week, they may not be somebody that you would have ever encountered in life or run across or even formed a friendship with. But when you're at your kid's events, 
with the same parents each week, that becomes kind of a friendship of convenience, right? You identify the the families that you enjoy spending those couple hours with, and some of those might grow into mm-hmm. other types of relationships, right? Well, maybe you do have a lot in common um, in one way or another, whether it be interests or values, and you do start spending more time. Or it just makes that event enjoyable, and then you kind of go your separate ways, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? We have to take a look at our own life in every relationship that we have and figure out what works for us and what doesn't work for us. And I'm kind of going to, again, relate this back to our episode on toxic relationships, but not every relationship has to be a core integral part of your your life. It's okay to have these kind of levels of relationships. I would agree. So long as you're finding value in them and the value and the vulnerability pieces. Nikki was speaking, I was thinking more about the vulnerability it takes to being open to engaging in the small talk that another parent at this football game might be trying to engage in. Mm -hmm. You're probably feeling all sorts of levels of uncomfort if you are not somebody who typically does not go out and seek the social interaction. But also asking yourself, like, is this something worth trying? That is an excellent point, right? For me, the gregarious talkative one is like, yeah, let me sit and and kind of introduce myself and get to know these other parents. For somebody else, that's going to be terrifying. And that's Mm -hmm. a very good point, right? And maybe if that's you, you try it, you put yourself outside of your comfort zone and you reap the rewards, right? You find out that this is enjoyable or this is somebody you'd want to form a relationship with. If not, I want to speak to all of those individuals out there. If it's not, you've tried it, you genuinely put effort into it and it's not rewarding for you, then know yourself and go sit at the top of the book, right? (laughs) Like you don't have to engage in quite as much small talk, right? But there's societal pressure to do that, but you don't have to. Like, what do you always say? Do you, boo? Do you, but do what feels right. But even at the same time, sometimes what feels right isn't necessarily always going to feel comfortable. Is that what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Okay. Because putting yourself in these situations can feel uncomfortable sometimes. But if you can push through it, imagining what reward lies on the other side of that and just being open to opportunity. And at this conversation, opportunity are really the social connectedness and As humans, as humans living through yet another global pandemic, what we have continuously found is that we do require social connectedness, whether that's via phone, in person, social media, internet. And I will say, and I kind of want to speak a little bit to that. How do you decipher making and keeping good friends in general versus making social acquaintances online? What are your thoughts on that? I think people are going to hate this answer, but it depends, right? Along so many things depend, right? I think you can have a very solid relationship with an online individual if that's your only option at this point, or um, there might be factors. I I I mean, this isn't exactly what you were thinking about, but I'm thinking about some of our very good friends that I've had for many years that we've hardly seen each other at all, but maybe twice or a negligible number of times over this whole thing. And we've transitioned to more of a virtual check-in because it's not just pandemic, right? But um, they just had a kid. Our kids are super busy. It's just been difficult to align schedules and such. So it's been like a, can you jump on FaceTime here and tomorrow at 6 o'clock because I miss you guys and let's check in. Um, So sometimes it's been a great tool, I think, to maintain Mm -hmm. connectedness in many ways. Again, I think it depends. Can it be a tool to maintain and foster connectedness? Absolutely. Can it be a relationship that is just purely online for that purpose similar to a you know an, a similar interest type of friendship yeah right if it feels if it fills you and it's healthy i would agree i feel like it could be a tool as well mm-hmm. it could be a tool to start relationships to maintain sustain relationships that have already been established but i would encourage you if you find that all of your relationships are primarily online i wonder what opportunity lies outside of that which again doesn't always feel comfortable but it is worth exploring yeah cuz nothing can fill that need that humans have right we're human beings we're we're social creatures even if you're an introvert you're still a social being as part of humanity and um to what degree you need to engage in this To be at a healthy level or maintain a healthy level, that's completely individualized. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we are social beings and so much of technology, I think it has taken away 
or not, right? I mean, I'm going to sound old and get on my soapbox here, but we look at the younger generations that spend so much time on their technology as a means of connecting, and you can just sit back and watch how much of it is lost, right? How much of that person-to-person interaction can be lost. So it can be a tool, yes, but it can also... <sighs> Ugh. Fill that. It can also be what? Ugh. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> I couldn't think of the right word, so I just went with the... Ugh. <laughs> And in our previous episode of recognizing and navigating toxic relationships, and if you haven't checked that out yet, do go so do 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 so and go back and <laughs> rewatch or listen to that. But if we're talking about signs of a healthy friendship, I would say one of the first signs that stands out for me is when you reconnect with somebody, regardless of how much time has passed, it's as though no time has passed at all, whether it's been three days or three years. That stands out for me as like a, a green flag instead of a red flag. Yeah, there's all right. Red flags <laughs> has good become sign like of a healthy, common theme right yeah. now in all these social media posts with red flag, red, red, red flag. Um, yeah. Uh, do you do you mean? And we talked about this in the toxic relations relationship episode a little bit, but it's going to be the opposite, right? Do you meet each other's needs? Is this a mutual relationship? And in these, especially if it's somebody you had for a long time, it can ebb and flow over time, right? There might be a period in your life where that friend is really stepping up for you because you've got a lot going on or you're going through a hard time, but then it evens out, right? And then it turns around and then you're able to really support them through tough times and it kind of ebbs and flows as you go through life. Uh, but there, I would say that there has to be that reciprocal balance to really have a healthy, positive relationship. And I would say, as we're speaking through this, our primary audience, if you're listening, is adults. Um, while we have heard there are some teenagers listening to this, we're primarily speaking to those of you who are in your adult life at some point and just recognizing what value certain friendships bring to you. And it really is about quality and not quantity. We're not saying go out and make all these new friends. But as an adult, even if we've convinced ourselves, and now I'm talking about me, that I don't need new friends, like I've got all the friends that I need and I'm good. I'm pleasantly surprised by the opportunity. I made the cut. (laughs) It's so true. (laughs) I am pleasantly surprised by what the universe has brought me in terms of valuable friendships and connections, again, on different levels. And and Nikki's totally right. Do you know who I saw and spoke to, like, throughout this entire pandemic? Nikki and our executive director, her wife, Stacy. (laughs) And it was something that totally brought us together. And I think now we're in this place of, like, oh. This is awesome. But it's not necessarily something that I thought would happen when I walked into work, you know, seven years ago. Like, man, I'm still going to be friends with Nikki seven years from now. (laughs) But it was also a different mindset. And I think I'm I'm encouraging you to evaluate the value that your friendships and your connectedness Mm -hmm. brings you. And how often are you open to or maybe not open to new connections and what possibilities lie in being open to that? Yeah, that's a big piece of it, right? Are you open to the idea? doesn't even necessarily mean you have to actively seek it out. But if you encounter something, that's someone, something that's pretty cool, kind of intrigues you, they're interesting, but you have this mindset of, I'm good, I've got my people and that's that, then you're not going to pursue anything with that person. And it could be that you're missing out on one heck of a relationship that could be there for a period of time or many years or the rest of your life, right? So just, are you open to it? Just or you dodge just, a bullet. That's true. <laughs> right? I just think like, that happens. Focus on the possibilities, <laughs> the positive possibilities. <laughs> but the reality is you're not going to jive with everybody, right? But if there is somebody that you do feel a connectedness with, like, what may come of that friendship exactly. wise? And that's fine, right? Like we're saying, you don't have to go out there and make friends with everybody you meet. But I think part of it is adult, as adults, too, is giving yourself permission, right? It could be that, hey, these are incredibly important people to me, and they have been for many years, or this is a new person that I met that I would love to pursue this with, but my kids need this, my spouse needs this, my work needs this, I'm supposed to start this workout plan, and that's going to take up that time. Giving yourself permission to treat yourself to relationships is, I think, a piece of this. As kids and adolescents, like, we're not thinking about that, right? Friends come first to many adolescents. So giving yourself permission as adults to, it's okay to foster this. It's okay I'm thinking right now, like, all the people I'm going to call when I get out of here today. But I know. Some um, of us might be thinking, like, dang, I haven't been the greatest friend over the last one year, one decade. <laughs> How do I fix that? <laughs> but ultimately, the reason we wanted to bring this topic to you today is because there's a high risk of feelings of isolation to really take over. 
And when you feel isolated, your brain starts to play tricks on you sometimes. So we would encourage you to use your social connections and your friendships as a means to maintain your mental health and your sanity, but also as a way to explore new opportunities and just being open to what the world has to offer you. Being open. I feel like a funny story to end on would be I pre-pandemic would have identified myself as highly extroverted, uh, not very introverted at all. I can balance with my introverted friends and spouse and such. But after a period of time into the pandemic, I was like, I think I I'm more introverted than I thought. Right. Like now I don't the idea of going out and seeing people sounds exhausting or man, I could be home alone working on this project or whatnot. And I never forget like the first dinner that I went out and had with friends after the pandemic initially set in. And once we initially shut down, (laughs) I remember I came home and I was like, honey, I'm still an extrovert. Like I feel (laughs) so juiced right now. And she's just (laughs) laughing like, Yes, we all knew that, right? But it was this, I just this mindset shift that had kind of occurred. And I think, honestly, a lot of it was just monotony and responsibility. Like, I could stay home and finish this project and all of these things. But you get a dose of it. It's like, oh, yes, that's still me. (laughs) If you feel like you're listening to this and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm totally an extrovert. Or, oh, no, I am totally anxious being around people. And if you feel like you're at a place where you can't manage it, that you've tried over and over and over, and now it's really negatively impacting you. We would encourage you to think about where resources are available, like therapy. Mm -hmm. And if you're in California, Nikki and I and our teams are available. Catalyst Counseling, Small Town Counseling, California. But even outside of California, there are tons of resources available. So if you notice that you're feeling these increased feelings of isolation or anxiety around connecting with people either online or offline and in person to where it's negatively impacting you, just consider what's available and what you're willing and open to accessing. Even if that's just one of your goals and you feel like you've been trying to accomplish that on your own, you need some extra support, let's make it happen. As always, thank you so much for joining us on the Therapist Uncut podcast. My name is Alyssa Nahara. This is Nikki Young. And thank you for helping us make mental health relatable and a part of your everyday conversation. For show notes on today's episode, you can visit therapistuncut.com. And if you haven't already, please subscribe, hit like, share with somebody that you love and care about and spread the goodness. We'll see you next time on Therapist Uncut. Thank you for joining Therapist Uncut, a production of AMP Smart Business. To learn more about Therapist Uncut and stay up on upcoming episodes, please subscribe and follow us on social media. As a reminder, although the Therapist Uncut co-hosts are licensed therapists, they are not your therapist. This podcast is not intended to substitute professional mental health counseling. If you need professional therapy, please contact your local provider or primary care provider. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of Therapist Uncut.